man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. This is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to become a victim of adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Let's pray for the sermon. Dear Father, we thank you that we can open up the, the, the word of God together uh, as we continue through the Jesus' sermon on the mount. We ask you to open our ears and uh, our hearts as we listen to this word and please bless um, what I say so that it is reflective truly of your heart and your words and what you would want to say to, uh, to us. We thank you for this privilege now of sharing the word of God together in Jesus' name. Amen. I am um, very, very thankful. Uh, so it's appropriate that we, we had uh, prayers of thanks uh, beforehand because Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and, and throughout the Word of God has given us the principles, the, the teachings, uh, the, the way to know him and to know God the Father and to be blessed in that union with the Holy Spirit, to become new creatures in him uh, that, that is not just now but into our futures and on into all of eternity. But one of the amazing things about the scripture and the teachings of the scriptures is that God, in all of his teaching, I think this is really, really important to consider in the Sermon on the Mount and the way Jesus is approaching this. The Apostle John said that God is love and that we know each other because we know that we are his because we love the brethren, but that love, <clears throat> the, the faith and the hope and the love, as Paul said numerous times, those are reflections of God's own spirit. That's the way he really is. And in these teachings that he's giving to his disciples and to the rest of the world, it's motivated by love. And that's why he gave these instructions in Matthew 5, verse 31 to 32, about divorce and about adultery. Because Jesus' whole emphasis here is, as I said earlier in, the, in, in the, the Sermon on the Mount, he starts off with the Beatitudes and saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for, they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The aim is always the kingdom of heaven. And taking those who will hear that call to his kingdom in every way and making them holy as he is holy, holy as God is holy, and becoming more and more righteous the way he is. And so uh, we looked already at, at the adultery in the heart and how those forms, and we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in the first chapters of Genesis where the first marriage was ordained, created between Adam and Eve. When Jesus is teaching here, he's following on exactly from that. His emphasis here, although he does not say it in those words, is on the sanctity of of marriage the protection of marriage and the protection of what is god's gift now as we said before in the in the early chapters of genesis he gives adam life and then makes eve out of adam to show him that he needs her and that they are part of each other and that they are joined then in the first marriage ceremony in union as one flesh they become one flesh so the very first gift outside of life and and of another human being that god gives is that of marriage it is a gift to humanity it's not just something that he just kind of came up with 
said, oh, I think that'll be nice for a kind of social cohesion or something, or so we can better our economic stats because then we'll have people living together and they'll contribute more to, to the, the overall economy. That's a great way that capitalists look at it. It is a divine institution, as we say in the various marriage ceremonies. It is a divine, a holy institution given to mankind. Now, not every single person gets to benefit from marriage, but it is that gift that God wants honoured for all time in every society. It's integral to his plan for developing children who are holy, and we will look at that later on, children who are dedicated to God. It's through the family. It's not through the state. It's not through policy. It's not even through community. It is through family that he develops those. And so, <clears throat> as always, we need to understand the context of this. So um, the, it, Jesus has been saying all along, well, you've heard it said, and this has been said, and so on has been said. And he's talking about how in that society, as he already prefaced this, as saying your righteousness has to exceed that. It has to blow away that of the scribes and the Pharisees. This is a response to an approach by scribes and the Pharisees to marriage and divorce and the way that they were setting themselves up. So we're going to look uh, carefully at the, um, the wording that he has here, but I want you to bear this in mind. When most people hear these verses, they hear the exception there, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality, they hear the exception and their mind immediately runs to, but what about, but what about, what, what, but what about? That's the way the vast majority of people respond when they hear these verses. But what about in this situation? But what about in that situation? But what about in that situation? When is this, is divorce permissible here, there, or so on? When is it permissible? And in fact, later on in Matthew chapter 19, we see the story where the scribes and the Pharisees do come to Jesus in conversation, in, in debate, and they ask him those exact questions and they have a debate with him about it. And he, he addresses these same things again with them. Jesus' emphasis, we must get this clear, is not on the circumstances of divorce. His emphasis is on the sanctity of marriage, that union, and protecting that union, and having faithfulness within marriage. That's actually his emphasis. And we see that throughout everything he does. And later on, when he does talk in Matthew chapter 19, he does refer to Genesis, as we, as we did the other weeks, in talking about how marriage came about and its purpose. So. Let's have a look at these verses in um, some detail. What I'm not going to do uh, at, at all is go through the ins and outs of when divorce is particularly permissible. There's one other section in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul addresses a particular situation and questions that he had from the Corinthian church about divorce. He addresses that. I'm not going to go through that at all because what I want to do is to talk, focus on to focus on what Jesus was saying about marriage. And so um, today, we're going to look at these verses, but we're also going to look at um, some stories that indicate, uh, that, that teach us about marriage. And I'm going to do that over the next two to three sermons. So although this is only two verses, um, it, it, marriage is so vital to everybody's lives. And it's not just vital to us now. It's not a matter of, well, I'm not, in this, I'm not married right now, therefore this is not relevant to me. Because it is such an integral part of society, therefore our own attitudes towards our, our marriages or the marriages of others, whether that's on down the generations, is a, a protective factor. We are to be the salt and the light of the earth. As Christians, we can help others, our own family, um, others that we meet and know in protecting this gift and savouring this gift that God has given them, no matter our own personal situation. Does that make sense? We can teach, as Jesus did, and help and support others through our families, through our extended families, through our 
through, for our friends, through acquaintances, anybody that we meet, we, we can do that. So, in these verses, so he says, starting off saying, it, 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 has, been, it has been said. So, this is a saying that is talked around. So, people will say, whoever divorces his wife, um, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, in referring to this, what Jesus is referring to is, um, and, and others were referring to, are the instructions in Deuteronomy, which are the one occasion where there is teaching regarding divorce. And this is in Deuteronomy chapter 24. If you want to turn there, Deuteronomy chapter 24 is a law given by Moses concerning divorce. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favour in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of the house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her, hates her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now, as Jesus later points out in Matthew chapter 19, the way the scribes and the Pharisees were handling this was they said, we can take that and we can basically come up with any reason that we want to divorce a woman. There were two schools of two trains of thought. One was very rigid and one was extremely relaxed. Um, I'll read out to you a little a portion of something that says, and this is from uh, France in his commentary regarding it. Um, there were disputes about it. Um, Moses gave the instructions regarding what happens, and you'll see this, if a divorce, if a divorce, if a divorce, if a divorce. The way the scribes and the Pharisees even interpreted it when they talked to Jesus later on in Matthew 19, he says, well, why did Moses command to divorce somebody? And Jesus says, well, he didn't command anybody to do that. What he did was, because of the hardness of your hearts, he allowed this, put this provision in there to deal with things in a sensible way, right, so that you will prevent, essentially, abuse. Because who were the people that were allowed to divorce, to give a certificate of divorce? Under Jewish law, it was the man. Under Judaism, there was, at the time, it does not seem that there was any provision for a woman to initiate a divorce. It was all the man. Now, under Roman law, women could divorce. And that's something that kind of what Paul is addressing later on. All the evidence that we have uh, of, of ancient manuscripts and, and historical details, the, the, the slim pickings that we have, the vast majority of divorces were initiated by men. There are a few instances that we have on record of women having divorced in that society. In Roman society, it was very different. There was a lot more of it happening, but in the Jewish society. So, France says this, the main area of rabbinic dispute was not the legitimacy of divorce itself, which everyone seems to have taken for granted, but the permissible grounds of divorce. And here, uh, Deuteronomy 24 provided material for debate since the husband's, excuse me, the first husband's decision is said to be based on his finding, quote, something shameful in the woman, while the second husband is simply said to have disliked her or hated her. On this basis, rabbinic teaching um, ranged from the hardline position of Shammai that only unchastity, that is, somebody had committed adultery or sexual immorality of some kind, was a valid ground to divorce, to the liberal position of Hillel, which allowed for a man to divorce his wife for such a trivial offence, actually wrote this in, as spoiling a meal. You're a bad cook. I don't like you. I'm going to divorce you. Uh, even simply because he had found someone else he preferred. I like her better. I divorce you. And what they had to do is they could just say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you three times. 
and then give the certificate of divorce, here you go, you're gone. And that was it. Now, consider the society. What is the woman to do in that situation? A young woman of still childbearing age, let's say, she does not have, not have the economic power and means to support herself, right? The vast majority of women, they had, they, they, they had these choices. They were dependent on the temple to give them arms of some kind, somebody else in authority, basically the state, the way that we would do, or they got married again. So the assumption was, I divorce you, you're free to remarry. You're going to go, and, and she would go, and so well, what else do I do? I'm going to go marry somebody else. The man then went and took the other woman. So I've got another one. Cool, she's younger, fresher, maybe she cooks better. You know what? Didn't like that one either. There's another one. And so what they were, were serial adulterers. Because they just went from hopping from woman to woman to woman. And the evidence is that in first century Palestine, in Jesus' day, it was the Hillel version of totally liberal, which is why we see in Matthew 19, they actually say to him, is it permissible to divorce a woman for any reason? Just whatever. Because that's the dominant area that they were in and they wanted to excuse themselves. And so that's what the people were being taught was, it's okay to divorce a woman, put her away. So who's, who is actually the victim here? It is the woman. The woman is the victim. So when Moses has these instructions in the law of God about her, he's, this is a protection for women. Saying so you can't just throw them to the curb and get rid of them and then you know, treat them like a dog. Nor can you, I divorced you, and then I go try a bunch of other women. You know what, I think I like the first one, and I'm going to bring you back. You've made, you've made her a victim of adultery. That's, that's what's happened. You've tainted her. And as we said before, uh, when we're talking about the, the principle of looking at somebody and then committing adultery in your heart with them, is that each individual is made in the image of God. Every man and woman is in the image of God. When you take that person and you, you, you use them, you are abusing them. When you did it in this way with adultery, you were abusing the woman. Now, it could happen the other way, that the woman would do it to the man, but it's sort of very rare that that, was, that, that that would happen because, and of course, the woman was economically dependent on the husband. She had less you know, motivation to go off on her own in that way. Um, so we had serial, serial divorce and adultery occurring. And Jesus said, you will not be like that. And he didn't actually say anything radically different from what Moses actually said here. Because Moses said, gave the allowance in that law, if she has committed sexual immorality. Because it is the one flesh bond that is part of the covenant between a man and a woman. The man and the woman are exclusively for each other. And as soon as you go outside of that, whether that's fornication or adultery or some kind of other sexual sin, you've broken that covenant. You've broken that one flesh arrangement. So the divorce is a recognition that that has ceased and, and go on from there. So... He says, Jesus says that to give the, the divorce certificate, but then he says, and with this phrase again that he uses repeatedly throughout the sermon, this part of the sermon, ego de lego, I, but I say to you, human, I, but I say to you that everyone, that's what the word is there, everyone, all who divorces his wife, everybody who divorces his wife, except on account of sexual immorality, causes her to, to be a victim of adultery. Now, I said it that way because in some translations, my old New King James, it actually says it causes her to commit adultery. But the word there in the Greek is a passive, meaning she's a recipient. The adultery has been done towards her. She is a victim of adultery. And various translations, I think the NIV, um, uh, other ones do use that wording. 
she's, she's made to be the victim of adultery because that's what's going on. There, right? that, that's what's going on in the mind of this man. I get rid of you, I get somebody else. Unless there is a legitimate reason for him to uh, divorce her. And then again, Jesus says, and whoever marries somebody who is divorced in that way commits adultery because the previous one was an illegitimate divorce. So the, she becomes a victim of adultery twice over. So that, that was Jesus' teaching, and it, and it is um, a very, very high standard. And it, it has caused all manner of consternation throughout the 2,000 years since he did it, because people say, well, that's a, that's a really, really, really tough standard. And, you know, when uh, in preparing this, and I, 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 I want to thank um, uh, various people that I spoke to in preparing this message, I wanted to be really sensitive about that, about this topic because it affects so many of us. We have gone through, my older brother went through divorce. Um, that was, what, 15 years ago. Um, we still feel the effects in incredibly difficult ways today, and his family does, because of that divorce. Um, in that case, he was the victim. But if it, it, it has been tragic for everybody. In um, Malachi chapter 4, there's a very famous verses, I think it's chapter 4, uh, sorry, chapter 2, very famous verses that express God's actual feelings about divorce. So this is Malachi chapter 2 in verse 10. So last book of the Old Testament that we in our order. Um, and it ends with, you know, the Old Testament ends with talking about the breaking of these covenants and, and about family and about how people do not honour God with all of their things. So in chapter 2 verse 10, uh, it says, Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us, every single one of us? Why, therefore, do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. So this is what Malachi is, the word of the Lord through Malachi. Why are we treacherous with one another? Judah has, in this case, he goes on from beyond the individual to talking about the whole of the tribes of uh, Judah and Israel. He says, Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, his divine institution, which he loves. He, that is Judah, has married the daughter of a foreign god. So he's here likens Judah and the nation to a marriage partner who's gone and committed adultery with somebody else. May the Lord, verse 12, cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awakened aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. And yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. This is the way he regards them historically, but he's talking about the marriage covenant, the personal aspect. Uh, he's been witness between you and the wife of you, your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant, right? God sealed that covenant. It was his gift. But he, did he not make them one, one flesh, as it says in Genesis, having a remnant of the Spirit, so the Spirit works in everybody in that way? And why one? Why did he make two people one? Because he seeks godly offspring. That is the purpose behind marriage and its covenant. Therefore, Take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. So he's transferring here back and forth between Judah and those individual families and saying, you are breaking your marriage covenants. You are treating the, your wife, your wives abominably. 
and you wonder why God doesn't hear your prayers? Because you're treacherous. For the Lord God, verse 16, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce for it covers one garment, one's garment with violence. Says the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And all you have to do is ask anybody who's been through a legitimate divorce whether or not they enjoyed that. It's not. It is filled with, it, it is a violent act. It may be necessary at times, but it is violent. And so therefore, that's, Jesus, that's God's attitude. So when Jesus is teaching that, he's saying, I don't want you to go through that. I don't want you to go through that. Don't do that. Don't do that to that wife. Don't do that to the woman or to the man. Be one. Seek godly offspring through that union. That's the purpose and that's the joy behind it. Some people don't have children. They still have the blessing of that marriage. Some people are single. That's given to them to be able to do and to enjoy. But when marriage is there, it's to be faithful. It's to be absolutely faithful because that is the way God is. He is absolutely faithful and does not break his covenants and that's what he wants us to do. And it is an absolute joy. And so as I said before, the, the, the gift of sex, of, of love, of companionship, all those things are built into marriage. And they are a wonderful thing. And that's why I said at the beginning that I'm really, really thankful um, because when I... Um, uh, two things, uh, many things. But first of all, my, um, my parents are in... So in 2025... Uh, they, God willing, will be celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. You know, they've had some really, really, really tough times. Okay, very, very challenging times. But it has been their commitment. My mum um, is, is a committed Catholic and said, I, you know, she's committed to her marriage. My dad is committed to their marriage. And despite all of the tough times, they have not separated they have not gone on down the path of divorce or anything because they said, we are committed to one another. And although it is various times when it's tough for us, I am, I know all of us as uh, children and then grandchildren and our great grandchildren are really, really grateful that my dad and mum are together and they're still together. They do get grumpy. They also are very happy many times and they clearly love one another uh, despite all the ups and downs of the years. Um, in, in fact, and um, I remember as uh, a young man, and as I say that we can be supportive of others, as a young man, um, they had some very, very close friends who knew that they, were, they had tough times and they had made arrangements for my mum and dad to go on marriage retreats together for a weekend, to be able to spend time together enjoying their marriage away from the five crazy kids, four really, you know, generally rambunctious boys. Um, uh, I was never a problem, but, you know, the, the <laughs> it was all the other ones. Julie wasn't really a problem, but um, so, um, but, you know, when they're, they're, they're jumping off the bunk beds onto the other bed so that they can kind of use that as a trampoline system and then getting into a fight and everything, it's like, it's going to drive anybody crazy. Um, and those friends did something extremely valuable because I, they saw the stress that my parents were under and took care of them, right? They went in and they said, we want to, we want to help make sure that your marriage is rock solid. And they helped them. That was such a tremendous gift. What an amazing thing to do for, for your friends. As opposed to the way that a lot of people in the world will do, say, why, why do you even bother staying together? What's the point? If my mum and dad had ever, had, had ever contemplated that and went down the path of divorce, they would just be more miserable now. Never would have worked out. I'm so grateful for that. Linda had a, a, an amazing marriage with Sid for decades. What an incredible gift that was, right? Ruth and Alan now, for decades now, married. Because you're old. But the fact that you've got that is such an amazing blessing, 
right, to have that throughout all the time. If you think about the circle of friends and people that you know, how many are still together over time? Very, very few. And I, I don't want to make this a set all about divorce, 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 but divorce statistics are outrageous. They're, they're crazy high everywhere. And amongst people who call themselves Christians, the divorce statistics are virtually no different from the rest of the world. Now, there is a difference with churchgoers, with regular churchgoers. They have much less divorce rates. And I don't know how it breaks down further from there. But um, um, I was talking with this about, over the phone with Mary uh, while she was away. And she said, well, I can't think of anybody, that, her old friends in Canada, who are still together after they got married. Bunches of people. They talk to people out in the community and they say, well, you know, I grew up with, uh, I think of all of my classmates and, um, you know, 30, 60 people uh, from all over the place. And only, out of all of those, only two of them, besides myself, are still together with their first partner and husband or wife. All the rest have broken up over time. It is rampant and it is sad. So the attitude here is to be thankful for what we have and what are provided and then to support people. Right? I, don't judge, I don't want to judge any of those people uh, for, 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 for what they've been through in the past. And certainly our policy as a church will be if we have people coming in who are divorced, um, you know, that, that join as members, we're not going to go and relitigate any of that and try to find out what happened in the past, whatever. Uh, as far as we're concerned, you're here, uh, God, you're asking for forgiveness for God for whatever was in the past, and we we'll regard all of those are legitimate. We're not going to go through some, you know, inquisition in order to try to, to, to determine something, because that's done, that's, that's, that's done with. But for our part, what we will do is that we will uphold the sanctity of marriage in our own lives and supporting others in their lives and in their marriages because in that way we are the salt and the light that we help preserve them we teach them we encourage them we help them and so with that in mind what i want to do is now talk turn to um the uh, i was going to say as well george um married for for, for decades and then supporting his wife uh, Coralie through the end of her life. Um, what a what an incredible example! What a wonderful blessing that he had that marriage for all those decades. Um, it is a it is a wonderful and beautiful thing. But if you turn to First Samuel, chapter eighteen. This is First Samuel chapter eighteen, and here we're breaking into the story of David. Now. Um, uh, Often David is picked up in terms of uh, his story of adultery with Bathsheba and uh, his very, very clear sin there. But here is a story, a love story, that happens with David. And this is with David and Michal. So this is in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and uh, starting down in verse 14. Actually, I'll just mention in verse 1. Um, Saul, sorry, David is kind of working for Saul. Saul's a... a Psychotic. He's got various issues and demon possession and other things going on. But Saul's son, Jonathan, was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. These two were blood brothers in every way. And Jonathan supported David in so many ways, even knowing that he had been anointed to be king instead of Jonathan. And in verse 14, uh, David behaved wisely in all his ways and the Lord is with him. And therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. He was a man of the people. And then Saul said to David in verse 17, Here is my older, do older daughter Merab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines, Philistines be against him. So Saul's ploy here was actually the same one that David used later on to kill Uriah, where he said, I'm going to send you out, marry you off, get you into battle, and let the Philistines kill him, and that'll get rid of, get rid of my enemy. So David said to Saul, he was wise, right, can he, who am I? What is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at that time 
when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given instead to Adriel the Mehalathite, get that right, as a wife. So Saul was quite happy to pass off to whomever for political expediency, his daughters. Now, Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. This is the only time in the Bible where it says a woman loved a man in that way, romantically, with using those words. Most often it's from the, the man's perspective, right? On this occasion, this is a love story. She loved him. She adored him. The thing pleased Saul. So Saul said, I will give it to him. This is the reason that pleased him, that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may, may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, Oh, you shall be my son-in-law today. And Saul commanded his servants, Communicate with David secretly and say, Look, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. You'll have your accession to the throne. So Saul's David spoke these words in the hearing of David. And David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law? seeing that I am a poor and lightly esteemed man. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, In this manner David spoke. So Saul said, right, it's pushing it. Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry, right? Because that was part of David's concern. You, you married into the family, you had to provide a very rich dowry. He says, The king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. I am really glad that my father-in-law did not say, Peter, you can marry Mary, but it's only after you give me a hundred foreskins of some guys I don't like. There are links who you'll go to, but I, you know, I just, I don't know about that. But Saul thought, right, he, and that happened because he was, he was saying, kill them and bring me the foreskins as proof. But Saul thought to make David, David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when the servants told David these words, it pleased David. He said, hey, great, okay, I'll become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired, therefore, of war. So David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. So he didn't just go 100, he went double. I'll give you double the dowry. Here you go, Saul. And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count to this king that he might become the king's son-in-law and then Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. Now the point here is David was literally willing to risk his life in order to marry Michal. She loved him. Doesn't say, doesn't say, however, he loved her. But he was willing to risk his life and thus become Saul's son-in-law, political alliance thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord is with David and that Michal Saul's daughter loved him and Saul was still more afraid of David so Saul became David's enemy continually and then the princes of Philistines went out to war and whenever they went out David behaved more wisely than all the servants so his name became highly esteemed now Saul spoke in chapter 19 to Jonathan his son and, told, and to his, all his servants that they should kill David. So he sends his son out saying, go kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. He was his best bro. So Jonathan told David, saying, my father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning. Stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak with my father about you. That then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, because his words, works have been very good, for he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, uh, talking about the giant. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it. You rejoiced. When, why, why will you sin against innocent blood? So he has this argument with him. And Saul says in verse 6, As the Lord lives, she shall not be killed. But he, ren he was reneging on that. And there was war again. Verse 8, David went out, fought the Philistines, struck them a mighty blow. And then this distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. In verse 9, David was playing music on his harp. Saul sought to pin David to the wall with his spear. What a great father-in-law. If you're getting any less than this, you should count yourself blessed because at least he's not trying to pin the guy to the wall with his spear. But David slipped away from Saul's presence 
And Saul drove the spear into the wall, slammed, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messages to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, look at this incredible romance. This is an adventure movie. You know, she's in love with him. They're married. Saul is so jealous he wants to pin the guy to the wall. He's running away. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window. She let him out, helped him to escape. And he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it on the bed and put a cover of goat's hair for his head and covered it over the clothes. Again, it's the old movie trick, right? You know, put it in the bedding. Let's go. You don't know who's there. So... So when Saul sent his messages to take David, he said, oh, she said, oh, he's sick. Saul sent messages back to see David, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. I don't care if he's sick, bring the whole bed. I still want to kill this guy. He was insane. And when the messages had come in, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair and then Saul said, so they found out. And Saul said to Michal, why have you deceived me, your father, like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michal answered, Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? In other words, well, he threatened me. Right, so she lied to cover, to cover herself and David and said, well, he threatened to kill me, so what else could I do? So she got off. David escaped. Now, after that, David escaped ran for years and we see then in chapter 20 which I'll make sure I get the right right section excuse me I've, I've missed the uh, I'm missing the section so later on David becomes king, and then we see him in, uh, yes, here it is, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel, Samuel chapter 6, David is now king, Michal is with him, and David in verse 17, they brought the ark of the Lord, well, actually verse 16, the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, they were now calling it, and Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David before the ark, leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. In that moment, she hated him. And they brought the ark in, so on, in verse 20, David returned to bless his household and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and he said, how glorious was the king of Israel today uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids, basically half naked in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of these base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. And I will be even more undignified than this. I'll be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of him you have spoken, by them I will be held in honour. And therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Because basically, he gave her, he, he didn't divorce her and allow her to remarry. He shut her up and said, I am not having, I'm, we're done. They had no children. Now, how come it went from glorious adventure romance to I despise him, and he's like, fine, I'm never, I'm never being with you ever again. Well, what happened in the interim, and you can go back and read it, uh, I'm just going to summarise it, was he went off after having fled Michal, and he found another woman and married her while he was still married to Michal. Then he found another woman and he married her while he was still married to Michal and the other woman. Right, it's polygamist. They started to have children. In the meantime, Saul said, fine, David's gone. And Saul took her and gave her, despite the fact she had been married to David, to another man. So she became the victim multiple times over of adultery. She was the victim. She was not out there trying to find another guy. Saul made her and she went and married somebody. And then what happened is once David came back, and he had power 
um, that he then actually forced Michal to come back as his wife. And it tells the story that um, he, 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 sent, he sent men and he said, and he said this, he didn't say, I love Michal and I want her back. He said, I want you to get me the wife that I paid 100 foreskins for. And they went and they grabbed her and the husband that she was with trailed afterwards weeping and crying to try to prevent her from being taken because he clearly loved her. She had no choice because the king gets what the king wants. And she was taken into that household. So you can understand why the relationship was soured and that when David did this thing in front of her, in front of all the people where he was whirling and dancing and so on, and a lot of people will take that and say, defend David and say, well, but, you know, it's okay, he was dancing before the Lord. There is some indication that he might have been dancing really inappropriately in a way that the pagans did before their, their gods, so she had some legitimate grievance that way as well. But at a minimum, she was the victim, and then he shut her up, said, fine, basically, you're, you sit in the tower and you can rot. This is what Jesus was saying, I do not want you to do to make these women a victim of adultery. To go around marrying them back and forth, treating them like that, as though they are garbage, they are not. They are your one flesh partner in life and should be always. I was very, now the thing is, what the story tells us is several things, right? We can pull out, pull out the lessons from it. First of all, it doesn't say that David loved her in the first place. Be careful whom you choose to marry. This is something we can tell everybody, right? Be really careful. It is a lifelong commitment. Yeah, you could get divorced, but you will still be suffering for that for the rest of your lives. I, I, I love watching these old, um, uh, you know, you can stream them so easily, various black and white movies and so on from the 30s, 40s, 50s and so on. And I see some of those, the, the stars on there, and I think, wow, what a beautiful, gorgeous woman. And she's so talented, and the guy's so handsome, good looking. And, you go, and so now you can go to Wikipedia and look up their lives, and you think, oh, I want to learn about their lives. And you go to read about their lives. And they're tragic, horrible, awful things where they were divorced again and, and they divorced others again and again and again. Miserable, ended up dying young from you know, drugs or alcohol or whatever it was. And again and again and again where they were just used and abused and they used and abused others. And it's so rare to see the one that stuck it through with the one man or woman and stayed with it. Like Charlton Heston, same wife, always. Never strayed. And it said it's because he's a Christian. He was devoted to her. So that's one thing. Another is, of course, the wandering eye that David had was obviously going to destroy the marriage. Long before Bathsheba, he had a problem with women, if you like to call it that. So they'd be careful of a, of a man that's like that, right, that, that you look and you say to your friends and others, you see a guy that has a wandering eye, don't go near him, don't. That's, that's not a red flag. That's a, that's a full get a fire engine in front and stop you, rescue you kind of thing from that. Same the other way around. So often happens today, people say, well, you know, he cheated on me several times, but he really does love me. Or she cheated on me, and she really does love me. So then, they, you know, we're going get, to get together and see how it works out. No, the first instance should have been your, your, your indication. Don't. That's it. Done. You, you don't have to. You don't have to commit. Even Joseph, and we saw before, Joseph and Mary, that she'd come down pregnant, and then he said, am I going to put her away publicly or privately? Because he wasn't going to con continue with it because he thought she'd committed adultery. They were betrothed. It was as good as married in, in, in that sense. And it was the angel coming and saying, no, no, it's the Holy Spirit. And then he was so good that he said, yes, I will take care of her now. But... The other warnings are that people can become very, very intimate with other people. It does not have to be a physical attraction before there is an emotional attraction to another person. 
And I want to read to you just this brief, brief section because from a book by Steve Farrar. This is called Point Man. This was written in 1990. Um, he had a series of books out. He was a pastor and then he engaged in men's ministry and uh, an American gentleman. And I, got, I picked this book up in the 90s, um, a few years after I was married. I found it really, really good practical advice from a Christian biblical perspective, but also from his experience with, with men and women and families and men leading families. He updated it, actually, it's published a few weeks after his death, a revised edition that he had made just last year. So he just passed away just last year. And it's still as relevant today as it was then. Um, but he says this, and um, I've managed to skip over the page I already had marked and uh, lost it. Um, this is in his chapter, uh, Real Men Don't. Uh, excuse me, sorry, because I had it marked and I, I just uh, messed it up. Um, okay. I remember a lunch I had with a guy several years ago. He was married in his late 30s and had a couple of kids. He was an executive with a larger ministry organisation. He had been in the business world for a number of years and had recently taken a huge cut in pay to work for this Christian venture. He appeared to be a committed Christian with a sharp family, good-looking family. As we were talking, I mentioned a book that I just finished reading on marriage. He lit up. I've been studying this book with a friend for the past six months and it's helped both of our marriages he said enthusiastically. For the next 10 minutes, he told me what he had been learning in the study with his friend. Yes, he said in summary, I'd recommend that book to anyone. It has helped me grow closer to my wife and my friend to grow closer to her husband. Suddenly, a blip appeared on my radar screen. Did he say it helped his friend grow closer to her husband? For some reason, I'd been assuming, and I think it was a fair assumption, that the friend was a he. I... He says this, I have a sophisticated approach to counselling. Basically, if I find a scab, I pick it until it bleeds. I had definitely found a scab, so I picked. I began to ask him some general questions about his marriage. Then I asked him about his friend. He made clear, it clear she was a strong Christian and that their relationship was strictly platonic. But the more I probed, the more he backtracked. After several minutes, I thought it was time to be direct. And so I, I asked, can I have your permission to ask you a personal question? And he said, yes. So I asked him that question, why are you studying that book on marriage with someone else's wife? I asked, have you ever thought of studying it with your wife? And I should have guessed what was coming. My wife doesn't understand me, came the reply. But your friend does understand you, right? Yes, we can really communicate. May I ask you another pointed question? Sure. Are you involved with your friend physically? Of course not, I shot back. Have you ever hugged her? He didn't say anything. Have you kissed her yet? No reply. Can I take a guess who your friend is? Oh, you, you don't know her. When I came into the office, there was a very pretty, uh, pretty blonde receptionist, tall, late 20s, very outgoing. Is that your friend? He didn't say anything. He just gazed out, of, out the window like a man looking for a bus that was an hour late. I had already pressed my luck, so once more wasn't going to hurt. I'm not a prophet, but let me make a prediction. Within six months, you'll be in bed together. He nearly came out of his chair. That'll never happen. Sure it will. It may be off. I may be off on the time, but it'll happen. This guy's mad now. That will never happen. He swore through clenched teeth. As kindly as I could, I told him the reason that it would happen was that he was convinced it couldn't happen. And pride always comes before the fall. And, and he says this, it could happen to me, it could happen to you, it, could ha it has happened to my friends, it has happened to yours. Better men than us have gone down. None of us are exempt. We are in spiritual warfare. And given the wrong circumstances, any one of us could go down at any time. We are in the greatest danger of all when we think we are safe. When a guy begins to think that this could never happen to him, then he needs to think again. I once heard Joe Aldrich, president of Mult Multnomah School of the Bible, make a statement that sent a little chill down my spine. He said, have you ever noticed how many men in the Bible failed in the second half of life? Our enemy is so cunning that he will wait 40 or even 50 years to set a trap. 
And that's precisely what happened to King David, talking about Bathsheba. That's why we can never deceive ourselves into thinking we are somehow above sexual sin. The moment you begin to view yourself in that light, you can be sure that your carcass will one day be hanging in cold storage. I came on pretty strong with this guy. He was so far gone in this woman that my only hope of pulling him back was to hit him hard. He knew the scriptures and he knew in his heart of hearts that he was wrong, but it was too late. He had taken the hook, he was already dead meat, and within weeks he walked out on his family. Another discarded wife, two more shattered children, another family for the casualty list. Why? Because he bought the lie that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, but it never is. Because the problem is this, when you leave your wife to commit adultery with another woman, you take yourself with you. And you are your biggest problem. I am my biggest problem, and you are yours. Protecting marriage for ourselves and for others is an absolute requirement. And we can do it many ways. This book, um, I, I think I will make it in, in the future, if I'm uh, counselling people of marriage, I'll make it required reading for them because uh, it's a warning to both men and women to protect and keep sacred their marriages and their families in so many ways. And we see it around us all the time. But Jesus said, don't go down that path. Don't even think it. Don't look it. Don't let it dwell in your heart. Put up barriers, put up every single roadblock, and you will be mocked by other people for it. I have been so many times over the years mocked for saying, well, you can watch a movie like that. Why don't you just go there, hang out with those people? Why do you need to spend time with your wife? Whatever. No, I am going to protect my wife. And I, just the same way as everybody else does, have had that kind of spiritual you know, attack, those temptations that occur. And I have to say, no, I'm not going to get anywhere near that with a barge pole. Because I'm going to protect my loving relationship with Mary. This incredible gift that God gave me, I'm not ever going to trample on it. And I've got to nip anything in the bud long before it happens. And who cares if somebody else mocks you? Because you can see the path that they go down, and it is that hanging carcass. And that's true, not just of this, but of everything that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is that the rest of the world will mock you. It will challenge you. It will try to take you away from that. It will say, you don't need to do that. You don't need to be concerned about that. What are you talking about? Not have to think about those things and not hate somebody and not do all of those things. Vengeance is sweet. All of these things I'll say to you. And they'll say, what are you, a wuss? What's wrong with you? Well, what's right with me is that I am a born-again child of God, that he is my saviour, and I am going to put my hand to the plough and never turn back because he has promised me a reward in heaven that will far surpass any of your passing pleasures that will give you pain anyway. And he has given me for this life now the blessings, the things that I can be thankful for are saying that he gives me these blessings of these pure relationships which are joyful and wonderful and fantastic. And I can have those without regret with everybody and anybody. That's what I'm aiming for. The goal of the law and of grace is Jesus Christ. That's who I'm aiming for. That's who I'm aiming to be like in every single way. And he's given me these gifts, whatever that is, and I'm going to treasure them and not treat them like dirt. That's what we can say to all of those things. So let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you give us the wonderful gift of um, love. Uh, whether that be through marriage or whether it be friendship, um, the, through family, all these things that you've set up for your glory and to bring us to you, to Christ, and to eternal life with you. We ask you now to uh, help us, not just in our own relationships, but yeah, to help us to be a help to others, to help protect their relationships, to protect their hearts and minds, and to bring them to you. We thank you for this awesome responsibility, but the fact that you have given us the spirit by which to do that and your teaching through your word to follow and obey. Thank you in Jesus' name.